Fundación Niemeyer, por la organización de este espléndido foro, al Instituto Aspen, por haber escogido Avilés, Asturias y, por lo tanto, España como sede de un evento de esta trascendencia y de esta profundidad. Y, finalmente, como no podía ser de otro modo, al Principado de Asturias, a su activa política de promoción de la, de la cultura, con la que nos sentimos tan identificados y con la que colaboramos tan estrechamente. Creo que es esencial en este tipo de, de debates intentar guardar la máxima brevedad posible e ir muy eh, directos al, al grano de, de, de la reflexión a fin de permitir el diálogo más fluido posible. Por lo tanto, me limitaré a compartir, intentar compartir algunas, algunas ideas que quizás después puedan ser objeto de la, del debate posterior eh, que seguirá a continuación. En primer lugar, quería decir, eh, compartir una reflexión completamente, completamente personal, pero cuando, cuando venía esta mañana hacia acá, esta tierra que conozco bien y en la que he tenido el placer de trabajar en el pasado, y, estaba, y observaba el, el, el programa del, del foro, me llamaba la atención, supongo que como a muchos de, de, de los que están aquí presentes, el carácter absolutamente transversal de las discusiones que han tenido lugar en estos días aquí en, en Avilés. Mm, al contrario de tantas otras conferencias internacionales con un tema absolutamente definido y cerrado, el eh, foro Aspen ha estado centrado en múltiples aspectos, todos ellos esenciales, pero al mismo tiempo vari variados y eh, conectados de formas no siempre evidentes, sino en una segunda tercera lectura. Yo creo que es un enorme acierto y que es representativo de lo que, de lo que entendemos que es la cultura el día de hoy. Eh, la, cultura, la cultura global que se está configurando en estos momentos es así, es fragmentaria, es compleja, es múltiple, es transversal, obedece a múltiples y a diferentes identidades al mismo tiempo y, sin embargo, también acaba refiriéndose una y otra vez a problemas que son un poco globales. Y es que los seres humanos siempre han eh, leído la realidad a través de la cultura. Esto es una, es una constante histórica que no creo que nadie pueda, pueda discutir. El, 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 los seres humanos, los hombres y las mujeres están en el mundo a través de su cultura. No, no, no sabemos eh, relacionarnos con la realidad e interpretarla si no es gracias a los parámetros, eh, a las guías, a las referencias que nos otorga el entorno cultural en el, que, en el que nacemos y en el que desarrollamos nuestra personalidad. Pero si esto ha sido así tradicionalmente, creo que en, en estos momentos, a comienzos del siglo XXI, lo es aún mucho más. Eh, a día de hoy, todos somos seres con una identidad doble, con una identidad anclada en lo real, en lo material, pero al mismo tiempo anclada en un mundo que no sé si llamar virtual, pero sí en un mundo que está formado de conexiones que son esencialmente culturales. Es decir, todos nosotros tenemos, eh, vivimos simultáneamente en varios planos, un plano cercano, un plano familiar, un plano en el que desarrollamos nuestra vida diaria y al mismo tiempo en un plano mucho más general que con, nos conecta con gentes de todo el mundo, y ante el que reaccionamos con los instrumentos que nos proporciona ante todo la, la cultura. En este sentido, es evidente que en estos momentos la importancia de la cultura ha crecido, eh, ha crecido enormemente. Es decir, la cultura es el instrumento que permite a seres de todo el mundo relacionarse, construir nuevos proyectos y trabajar, y trabajar conjuntamente. Y es el instrumento también que nos permite eh, entendernos los unos, a, los unos a los otros. En ese sentido... La importancia de lo, que, de lo que aquí se ha llamado diplomacia cultural no puede ser más evidente. Creo que es eh, prácticamente imposible para cualquier nación democrática y avanzada a comienzos del siglo XXI de pretender desarrollar una diplomacia que no sea una diplomacia cultural. La diplomacia tradicional, la diplomacia, lo, que, lo que venía llamándose el, el hard power, la diplomacia de, los, digamos, de, la, de, la, de la fuerza, de la imposición, no es ya la propia en nuestras sociedades. No es adecuada para, las, para el, el, eh, entornos complejos en permanente movimiento y tampoco lo es para la proyección digamos, de los valores democráticos y de las sociedades multiculturales. Necesitamos otro tipo de relaciones entre Estados, otro tipo de relaciones entre sociedades que solo puede estar basado por una parte en el respeto a la diversidad cultural y por otra, por supuesto, en el intercambio cultural, en la creación de, eh, en, en un proceso que, que, está, que está en curso y que es evidente, en un proceso de creación de una nueva cultura global, 
que muchos vemos eh, como ya naciente, pero que obviamente aún no está consolidada. Desde luego, así lo entiende el, el, el Gobierno de España, el que representó aquí esta tarde, y eh, prueba de ello son, por ejemplo, iniciativas como la Alianza de Civilizaciones, que ha sido, la, digamos, el gran proyecto estratégico de la acción exterior española eh, de este Gobierno. La idea de que la relación entre pueblos debe basarse ante todo, además de las relaciones económicas, de las relaciones eh, tecnológicas y de otro tipo, debe basarse en la búsqueda de valores comunes entre culturas y civilizaciones, que por un lado son diversas y distintas, pero por otro lado comparten un núcleo duro de principios que es el único sobre el que podemos pretender fundar una nueva sociedad internacional. Ya no tiene sentido a un nivel más práctico, ya no tienen sentido las acciones, las acciones de diplomacia tradicional, digamos promocional, esa... esa mmm, esas, eh, esas actuaciones dirigidas, digamos, a vender la idea de un país, a vender un estilo de vida separado de los demás. Las cosas ya no son así. Es decir, uno, eh, cuando, cuando se, en estos momentos, cuando uno se plantea una actuación internacional, debe planteársela sobre la base siempre de la, colabora, de la colaboración, del intercambio, del diálogo. Les daré un ejemplo. Acabo, acabo de regresar de Nueva York. Acabo de pasar unos, unos días en, en, trabajando en distintas actividades de, de mi ministerio y eh, es muy interesante comprobar de primera mano lo que está sucediendo, por ejemplo, con la cultura eh, en español. Como saben, eh, Estados Unidos va camino de configurarse muy rápidamente como uno de los dos o tres, eh, una de las dos o tres naciones del mundo con más hablantes eh, españoles y con más gente de, de origen eh, en una cultura hispana. Sin embargo, es completamente equivocado afrontar esa cultura como si fuera eh, un, un segmento o una, una realidad inmutable, heredada, anclada, en, digamos, como puede serlo la, la tradición cultural española de los siglos XVII, XVIII, etc. Lo que, uno, lo que uno observa cuando va allí es el nacimiento de una nueva cultura española, que también es anglosajona, que también es americana, americana del norte, americana del sur. Eso, eso es lo que está ocurriendo. Y eso está ocurriendo, por supuesto, con los hispanos de Estados Unidos, pero está ocurriendo con, la, con, eh, con los grandes países de Asia, está ocurriendo en Europa. Es decir, está emergiendo una nueva cultura de la globalidad. Una cultura global que solo podemos esperar que esté fundada en la democracia, en el respeto mutuo, en la comprensión, en el intercambio y en la, en la consolidación de una serie de valores fundamentales. En ese sentido, me parece esencial el trabajo que se realiza en foros de este tipo, en los que están representados todo tipo de nacionalidades, de ideas, pero en los que al mismo tiempo existe una identidad y una comprensión básica de lo que son las guías rectores de la, de, de la política cultural en el sentido más amplio del siglo que viene. Nuevamente, mi mayor enhorabuena a los organizadores del foro, mis mejores deseos para lo que queda de ello y esperamos con enorme interés las conclusiones que de aquí van a salir. Muchas gracias. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Es para mí un honor clausurar esta tarde el Foro Internacional de la Diplomacia Cultural que se ha venido desarrollando en Avilés desde el pasado lunes en el marco de las actividades que organiza la Fundación Niemeyer, a la cabeza su director. Eh, buenas tardes, Natalio. Que me honro, además, Fundación que me honro en presidir. Más allá de lo que ha dicho Guillermo Corrales, que es un deseo, que es verdad que va encaminado, pero hasta ahora las culturas han estado en nivel dialéctico, con lo cual eh, esa base de principios que todos deseamos, y los políticos más, es muy plausible, pero hasta la fecha hay que reconocer que las culturas y las políticas han estado a nivel dialéctico, con lo cual una predomina sobre otra. Es verdad que estos foros contribuyen a que eso se difumine, pero que seamos conscientes que hay un largo camino que recorrer, porque la historia nos dice que eso no ha sido así, ni en vía diplomática al uso, ni en vía política, ni en vida cultural. De hecho, los enfrentamientos que todavía tenemos a nivel del mundo han dado lugar a que 
Esos niveles dialécticos llegarán incluso a los enfrentamientos bélicos, como todos sabemos. Con lo cual, hay que ser voluntaristas, pero creo que estos foros y la política contribuyen a que esos mecanismos se mmm, difuminen y que estemos en un camino capaz de desarrollarlo, sin ninguna ingenuidad. Pero la vida real es así, que es dura, y es importante saber que estos foros contribuyen en un foro universal, global, por lo tanto, a que esos mecanismos lleven los caminos que tienen que llevar, que son los caminos de la democracia. Una vez dicho esto, que es una reflexión personal, pero que fruto del estudio de muchos años y de mucha observación y de mucha práctica política, incluida en mi país. Antes que nada, quiero hacer público mi reconocimiento al Aspen Institute de Washington por su iniciativa para desarrollar un encuentro de esta envergadura en colaboración con el Centro Cultural Internacional Oscar Niemeyer y un espacio histórico cultural tan señalado como es este Teatro Palacio Valdés, en una ciudad como Avilés, tan vinculado además a la historia de los Estados Unidos y a través de la ciudad de San Agustín de la Florida, porque la historia es terca y la historia está ahí y los imperios existieron, aunque quisiéramos que no vuelvan a existir, pero existieron. Y todavía tenemos esos, esos últimos destellos mmm, de los antiguos imperios. En imperios donde la democracia no era existente y hay que contribuir con estos foros a que se desarticulen de nuevo. Y les felicito igualmente porque he podido seguir los resultados de esos distintos coloquios y ponencias que han ofrecido ustedes estos días y que considero del mayor interés para cuantos estamos preocupados tanto por el devenir del mundo cultural como por las distintas implicaciones que pueden tener las actividades culturales en el amplio mundo que nos ha tocado vivir. Un mundo que ciertamente no ha cambiado sus medidas físicas, pero que ha multiplicado hasta el infinito sus dimensiones intelectuales y virtuales. Consecuencia de una globalización que ha traído consigo la sociedad informatizada. Y yo no estoy en contra de la globalización, no lo estoy, porque hay valores de la globalización de los cuales yo estoy muy a favor. Me encantaría que los derechos de los trabajadores fueran globalizados, que los derechos de la sanidad fueran globalizados. Todo lo que trae la globalización no es malo, pero hay que matizarlo y extenderlo en los valores que nosotros consideramos que hay que extenderlos, desde luego, desde la posición política progresista que yo defiendo. Un famoso pensador alemán ya dijo en su día y dejó escrito que hay respuestas que son sí o sí, o no, o no, son respuestas metafísicas, porque la vida todo tiene a la vez su sí y su no. Eso es justamente lo que sucede con nuestro actual modelo y sus consecuencias, modelo que no está establecido, modelo que tendremos que trabajar, modelo que estamos buscando y modelo que tendrá unas consecuencias en nuestra praxis contemporánea porque estamos ante un fenómeno de incalculables dimensiones y, además, de múltiples facetas bien distintas. Algo que, justamente, estos días ha salido a luz gracias a sus encuentros, entre otras cosas. En tiempos de incertidumbre, de desconfianza en el futuro, como los que estamos viviendo, lo primero que en apariencia peligra es la creación. O, él, o al menos eso es lo que dicen todos aquellos que piensan que la creación y sus entornos son elementos prescindibles en nuestra cultura. No obstante, aquellos que ponen la cultura bajo sospecha son los mismos defensores a ultranza del pensamiento único que no reparan, bien porque no les interesa, bien porque no les conviene, en que precisamente esa confrontación de ideas en la dialéctica y el diálogo es donde crecen las nuevas ideas y, por lo tanto, los nuevos modelos. Puedo garantizarles que ustedes están en territorio seguro, porque en Asturias, 
la cultura no está bajo sospecha. Tienen un buen ejemplo aquí mismo, en este centro Nimeyer, confío en que ustedes hayan comprobado esta semana que a través de este foro será un gran lugar de encuentros y de prácticas democráticas, de cultura como vigor cívico y reconstrucción a través de la identidad local, a través de grandes elementos globales. El Centro Nimeyer, gracias al cual los asturianos estando siendo, estamos siendo muy conocidos nacional e internacionalmente en los ámbitos artísticos, están concitando apoyos creando nuevas esperanzas y, sobre todo, ejemplificando la confianza en el futuro y la imagen de recuperación de una de nuestras principales ciudades ante sus propios vecinos. Posiblemente nunca antes un proyecto cultural de nueva implantación haya generado un reconocimiento y una identificación tan intensa en tan breve espacio de tiempo en Asturias. A diferencia de otros casos nacionales e internacionales en los que la ubicación y su proceso no estuvo exenta de conflictos, esta propuesta del Gobierno asturiano, un Gobierno socialista y progresista al que tengo el privilegio de pertenecer, ha personificado la nueva identidad de la ciudad recogida en su plan humanístico y que da a la ría una personalidad definida y un papel articulador del nuevo Avilés del siglo XXI. La desprendida actitud del mayor arquitecto del siglo XX, Oscar Niemeyer, para con Avilés y para con Asturias, recuerden que fue premio Príncipe de Asturias, propiciada por su reconocimiento con este premio, Hizo posible contar con el mayor de los proyectos de este creador universal en Europa. El Nimeyer ilustra perfectamente nuestra concepción de la cultura. Lo que nosotros llamamos cultura resume principios, valores y tradiciones muy distintas o opuestas a las identificaciones simplistas que otros propician. Ni la cultura es el mercado ni tan solo las bellas artes, ni un sistema cerrado de expertos que determinen qué es y qué no es válido en materia de creación o de práctica cultural. La cultura que defendemos nace en redes, en vínculos, en diálogos, en controversias y en desacuerdos, como toda materia viva y, en cambio, permanente, que aspira ni más ni menos a contribuir a cambiar el mundo para mejor. Y además, ¿por qué no? La cultura es riqueza y puede producir riqueza. Y también a eso aspiramos, a que nuestros productos culturales, quienes lo crean, tengan esa visibilidad y reconocimiento aquí y fuera y que tenga un feedback económico para nuestra ciudad y para nuestro territorio, por lo tanto. En estos últimos años, el Gobierno del Principado de Asturias ha puesto en marcha la columna vertebral de sus redes de servicios culturales. La confluencia de inversiones públicas nos está permitiendo experimentar un salto cultural sin precedentes. Aspiramos a convertirnos en un referente cultural gracias a proyectos como el Centro Nimeyer, con el que espero se han podido familiarizar durante la celebración de este foro. Queremos ser más visibles en todos los campos. Asturias está emergiendo en el mundo de la creación tecnológica global, como ya hizo Irlanda en su día, con propuestas que desafíen fronteras y que nos coloquen en ese amplio grupo de espacios que lideran las nuevas tendencias en los diversos campos de la cultura hoy. Miramos al futuro sin desdeñar nuestra rica historia, nuestros equipamientos presentes y futuros y constituyen en esos ejes culturales enfocos poderosamente atractivos en esos términos culturales y económicos. Todo el potencial de cada una de nuestras infraestructuras culturales debe servirnos para abrir nuevas y enriquecedoras vías de relación con nuestros creadores, 
porque, repito, la cultura aquí no está bajo sospecha, y mucho menos los creadores. Les reitero de nuevo mi agradecimiento y quisiera decirle al representante del Ministerio de Cultura de España que Asturias considero, y así lo manifiesto en todos los foros españoles, europeos y allí donde puedo llegar, es el laboratorio de la cultura de España. Porque si, sin renunciar a nuestra propia identidad, creemos que Asturias es el modelo que tiene que seguir España. Guillermo, lo siento, pero es lo que creo. <ríe> y tengo que decírtelo. Les reitero de nuevo mi agradecimiento por estos fructíferos días transcurridos en torno a la siempre grata reflexión sobre los problemas de la cultura y reitero asimismo nuestra firme voluntad de seguir colaborando con ese futuro y con, con su futuro y con el nuestro, del Aspen Institute, dentro de ese gran proyecto cultural que desde nuestra fundación contemplamos para esta margen obra que va a ser un hito el centro Nimeyer. Muchas gracias a todos, a cuantos han protagonizado este foro, como parte activa o como fieles espectadores. Y creemos que la democracia, los imperios están de más. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Gracias. Um, is this on yet? Yeah, no, we're good. How are we doing? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, it is is uh, really a pleasure for me to uh, to be here and have an opportunity in my turn to thank uh, the Aspen Institute and the Neymar Foundation for hosting this uh, this wonderful conference. Uh, I have been in this business for a very long time, and yet I have uh, I've learned many new things and have been uh, completely re-energized, in spite of the fact I haven't been able to sleep since I've been here, um, but re-energized by, uh, by the conference and, uh, and, and all that you have, have brought to it. So this is the final plenary. And uh, I'm not sure how the time is going to work, but if it happens that we are able to carve a little time out at the end, um, for those of us who wanted to go to one concurrent session and were, had to make a hard choice, uh, a couple of quick questions uh, maybe on uh, to, uh, to uh, take advantage of the last plenary and asking questions from one of the sessions that you weren't able to attend. We'll see if we can, uh, we'll see if we can get to that. But before then, we have um, uh, what I hope will be a very informative and, and very enjoyable uh, panel. Um, in a sense, it's going to be divided into, uh, into two uh, basic areas. Uh, first of all, we have uh, The, we've been talking about uh, cultural diplomacy and uh, the, uh, the intersection of cultural diplomacy and, uh, and security. And, and nowhere is that more relevant uh, than in the country whose minister of international and regional cooperation uh, we are honored to have among us. Today, uh, Minister uh, Raymond Shibanda from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And uh, he is going to talk about the, um, uh, the challenges that uh, he faces in his uh, high responsibilities and that his country faces as it uh, looks to the future. 
Um, and after that, we have uh, someone who was not new to you, uh, Cynthia Schneider, uh, who is one of the uh, most effective voices for cultural diplomacy and public diplomacy uh, in Washington, and uh, she travels a, a, good, a good bit, is a member of a number of boards and organizations, and is one of, as I say, she's one of the, the great cultural warriors in our, uh, in our firmament. Um, I will have some uh, remarks to make also about uh, cultural diplomacy and, uh, and government action, because we haven't really talked very much about government here. We've talked about cultural actors, we've talked about your organizations, the fantastic work that you do uh, for the, uh, the protection of cultural treasures, the repatriation of lost uh, cultural uh, artistic um, treasures. Uh, we've talked about uh, the challenges facing uh, your organizations, but we really haven't talked very much about uh, the 600-pound gorilla in the room, uh, which is government. And indeed, uh, my own definition of cultural diplomacy, uh, and I'm quite comfortable with the def definition of uh, cultural diplomacy that, uh, that my good friend Sharon Mimis has, has put forward. She's more comfortable with cultural relations in the context that we've been discussing, and so am I. Uh, cultural diplomacy conveys to me something that is um, yeah, policy-driven. Uh, that is something that governments do. Uh, cultural, I'm, more hap I'm happier with cultural relations or cultural engagement. Uh, I, I, I was uh, interested to read uh, in the program book, The Arena of Cultural Diploma Diplomacy, of, of cultural diplomacy has been democratized and widened beyond the activities of professional diplomats. Well, we could have used the help along the way, um, and I'm glad to see that, uh, that, that that's, that's what's happening in the future because, in fact, uh, our abilities as a government to, uh, to perform cultural diplomacy have been diminished, and whatever uh, assistance can be provided by those of you in, in the room and the organizations that you deal with uh, will be necessary uh, until we sort public diplomacy out as it is, uh, at its, as it is practiced in, in the United States today. Um, but before we go any further with government's role in the United States, I would like to uh, ask His Excellency the Minister uh, for his, uh, his reflections on the issues that we've been, been discussing, uh, particularly the, uh, as they apply to the Democratic Republic of Congo. He's got a statement to make in French. Um, I will give it my best shot to, uh, to do a consecutive translation, and Cynthia will help out if I get stuck. Uh, Monsieur le ministre, une parole, c'est à vous. Merci. Je ne sais pas si le micro fonctionne et si on m'entend dans la salle. J'ai été invité aux travaux du présent forum pour parler de la culture comme priorité politique en vue d'une sécurité durable. I was invited to participate in these, this present forum to talk about culture as a political priority in, uh, in view of the uh, of, of, of durable security. En fait, il s'agit de voir comment la culture peut aider à prévenir, à résoudre les conflits, mieux à préserver et à consolider la paix. In fact, it's not only the resolution, but also and especially the prevention of conflicts, or more positively, uh, to the, the preservation and the consolidation of peace. Je voudrais remercier les organisateurs du forum, particulièrement Dr. Damien Pono, de m'avoir adressé cette invitation qui m'honore et qui, pour mon pays, ne pouvait mieux tomber. 
I'd also like to sincerely thank the, organization, the organizers of the forum, particularly Dr. Damien Pono, uh, to have, for having invited me, which uh, honors me and which for my country couldn't come at a better time. Je suis, on vous l'a dit, de la République démocratique du Congo. C'est un pays qui est aussi grand que l'Europe occidentale, qui est peuplé de 60 millions d'habitants, doté d'incommensurables ressources naturelles. C'est une mosaïque de plus ou moins 350 tribus et d'autant de dialectes, un espace où cohabitent chrétiens catholiques et protestants, musulmans, kimbangistes, animistes, un réservoir intarissable de, de talents artistiques, particulièrement dans le domaine de la musique. Bref, c'est un exemple type de diversité culturelle. I'm from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, a country that is as big as Western Europe, that has a population of more than 60 million inhabitants, that is blessed with uh, great natural resources, which is a mosaic of more or less 350 tribes and as many dialects, uh, as a space where Catholic Christ Christians, Protestants, Muslims, Kimbangist and animists uh, reside together, a, a great uh, reservoir of artistic talent, especially in music. In short, uh, the example of cultural diversity. Mais la RDC est aussi un pays post-conflit qui se remet doucement mais résolument d'une longue période de guerre ruineuse. But the uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo is also a post-conflict country that is coming back slowly but surely from a long period of ruinous war. Une guerre qui, directement ou indirectement, a coûté la vie à près de 6 millions de Congolais et provoqué la destruction massive des infrastructures socio-économiques de base. A war that directly or indirectly has cost the lives of 6 million Congolese and has caused the, destruct, the massive destruction of infrastructure, uh, socio-economic uh, socio infrastructure, uh, a, a war that has... Uh, I'm sorry, Go, uh, okay. I'm moving ahead of you. Uh, une guerre qui, à un moment donné, avait impliqué plus de 10 armées africaines, déstabilisant l'ensemble de la région des Grands Lacs. A war that, uh, at any given moment, has, has involved 10 African armies, uh, and which dis destabilizing all of the region of, of the Great Lakes. <coughs> C'est dans ce pays en pleine reconstruction que j'exerce les fonctions de ministre de la coopération internationale et régionale et que je suis notamment chargé de la prévention et de la gestion des conflits tant entre Congolais qu'entre le Congo et ses voisins. In this country that is in, in full reconstruction, I am responsible for the functions of minister of cooperation, international and regional cooperation, and I'm especially charged with the prevention and the management of conflicts uh, as much uh, between Cong uh, Congolese as between the Congo and, and her neighbors. Pour mon pays comme pour moi-même, la guerre et ses souffrances ne sont donc pas de la théorie, mais du vécu, du concret. For my country, as well as for me, war and its, suffer and its sufferings uh, are not theoretical, but lived. Promouvoir la paix n'est pas une aspiration, mais un devoir. The promotion of peace is not an aspiration, but a duty. Faire de la culture une priorité politique en vue d'instaurer et de préserver la paix n'est pas un luxe, mais une nécessité. To establish culture as a political priority uh, with a view toward Installing and preserving peace is not a luxury but a necessity. C'est dire donc que j'ai accouru quand j'ai reçu l'invitation parce que convaincu que ici à Avilès j'aurai la chance d'écouter et d'apprendre 
que ce serait une expérience enrichissante pour moi. Et cela l'a été au-delà de toutes mes espérances. And that is why I accepted the invitation of the Aspen Institute to come here to Aviles to listen and learn, uh, convinced that this meeting will be an, ex an enriching experience for me and that and it has been that beyond my hopes. Je suis aussi venu désiré d'apporter par mon témoignage ma modeste contribution à la construction d'une coalition mondiale pour la paix par la culture. Et j'espère ne pas décevoir. Um, and I, I've also come uh, hoping to bring what, with, my, uh, uh, with my witness, by witnessing my modest contribution to the construction of a worldwide coalition for peace through culture, and I hope that this, this will not be thwarted. Alors, quand je regarde ce qui s'est passé en République démocratique du Congo et dans la région des Grands Lacs, je me rends compte que les causes de la guerre qui a sémé la mort et la désolation dans cette partie du continent africain ne sont pas différentes de celles qui, il y a 70 ans, ont conduit à la, deuxi guerre, à la Deuxième Guerre mondiale. When I look at the war that has caused the, the death and desolation in the Republic of the Congo and in the Grand Lakes region, for 12 years, it seems to me no different from the reasons that have 60 years ago led to the second, uh, the, to World War II. Um, quelle, que, quelle que soit la forme que ces causes aient pu prendre, elles sont pratiquement les mêmes que celles qui ont prévalu au Liberia, en Sierra Leone, qui ont conduit au génocide au Rwanda ou à la menace d'éclatement heureusement avortée de la Côte d'Ivoire. Whatever the reasons, they are uh, not different from that which has led to the de devastation in Liberia or in Sierra Leone, uh, or the uh, genocide drama in Rwanda, or the threat happily averted uh, in uh, Côte d'Ivoire. Je résumerai ces raisons en quatre présentées de la manière suivante. Premièrement, c'est le déni des droits humains et des libertés fondamentales, dont le droit au respect et à la dignité de chaque personne, de chaque nation ou de chaque culture, droit qui pourtant est à la base du principe de l'égalité souveraine des États si essentiel pour la paix internationale. I will summarize the four reasons uh, that led to these conflicts uh, as follows. The denial of human rights and of fundamental liberties, uh, including the respect uh, and dignity to each person, each nation, each culture, uh, a right which is, uh, which never, nevertheless is part of the, uh, the, the basic principles of equality and sovereignty among nations and is so essential for international peace. La deuxième raison, c'est l'ignorance et ses corollaires que sont le préjugé et l'incompréhension mutuelle, source de suspicion et de méfiance et transformateur de désaccords en conflits irréductibles. Les accords qui peuvent être petits deviennent des conflits irréductibles parce qu'on est ignorant, parce qu'il y a des préjugés, parce qu'il y a l'incompréhension mutuelle. Number two, the ignorance, uh, ignorance and its corollaries, prejudice and mutual misunderstanding, which are sources of suspicion and mistrust and, and transform Uh, disagreements into, uh, into hard conflict. Troisièmement, l'intolérance et l'absence de dialogue qui accélèrent les désaccords. Third, intolerance and the absence of dialogue which accelerate disagreements, uh, which ex accelerate disagreements. Quatre, la perte de repères moraux avec pour conséquence 
le primat de la survie individuelle sur celle de l'humanité est partant la banalisation de la vie humaine, de la souffrance, de l'injustice et de la discrimination. The loss of, or the, the loss of, of moral standards uh, with consequence, uh, consequent uh, uh, excusez-moi un moment. <laughs> Perdre de repères, mais on ne peut pas se passer de prime de la suivi individuel sur ce. Which leads to the, um, the primacy uh, of individual survival over that of humanity and the banalization of, uh, the, of human life, of sufferance and injustice and, 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 and discrimination. Ça devient banal de tuer et de violer, de, bru de, de brûler le corps humain à cause de cette, de cette perte de, de repères moraux. It becomes ordinary uh, to, uh, to kill, to burn, to be, uh, to be cruel because of the loss of, this, uh, uh, of these moral standards. Comme on le voit, la guerre est généralement due aux mêmes causes. En prendre conscience, c'est reconnaître à la fois l'importance de la culture et la nécessité de la diplomatie culturelle. Mais c'est aussi souligner la responsabilité que nous avons, particulièrement nous qui avons la charge de préparer et de développer les politiques publiques, la responsabilité que nous devons de promouvoir la culture et la diplomatie culturelle. Um... Face à la problématique... Je suis un peu perdu. Face à la... The causes of, of the war are uh, generally the same. That reconnaître à la fois l'importance de la culture is to recognize uh, the importance of culture and the necessity of, dipl of cultural diplomacy. Uh, it is also to understand the, the collective responsibility that, new ha that we have to promote uh, one and the other. Pour nous qui sommes chargés de définir les politiques publiques, cette responsabilité se décline en plusieurs paramètres. Premièrement, la responsabilité d'être attentif à toutes les sensibilités de la société. C'est pas là-dedans. Premièrement, la responsabilité d'être attentif à toutes les sensibilités de la société. The necessity to be attentive to all uh, sens sensibilities of, uh, of, uh, of, of the, uh, de, de, so de la société, parce que, okay. excusez-moi. Oui, oui. Premièrement, de deuxièmement, la responsabilité de promouvoir une culture qui valorise plutôt que de dénigrer. It's necessary to recognize a culture that, that, uh, that validates rather than uh, uh, destroys. Une culture qui prêche l'amour plutôt que la haine. It is uh, a culture that is closer to love than to hate. Une culture qui, qui est un vecteur de rassemblement plutôt que de division. A culture that is closer to, uh, to uh, bringing people together than to dividing them. Une culture qui renforce l'estime de soi et l'estime de l'autre. A culture that reinforces um, both uh, self-esteem and the esteem of others. La troisième responsabilité, c'est celle de veiller à ce qu'on apprenne de l'histoire et qu'on n'oublie pas. Uh, la, troisième. la troisième responsabilité, c'est de veiller, d'apprendre de l'histoire et de veiller à ce qu'on n'oublie pas. OK, la troisième responsabilité est de rester conscient du fait de ce qu'on a 
Francis qu'on a appris, what has been learned from history, yeah. and, and what and not to forget uh, what has been learned from history. La quatrième responsabilité, c'est de consacrer à la culture les ressources suffisantes pour son développement. Uh, encore une fois, vous plaît. Consacrer à la culture des ressources suffisantes pour son développement. Uh, the fourth is to, uh, to give to culture what it requires for, for its development. Très souvent, quand les gouvernements doivent décider face à beaucoup de besoins, la culture est classée en ordre secondaire par rapport à d'autres besoins de l'État et ne reçoit donc pas suffisamment de ressources. Too often, when governments have to make decisions on resources, uh, culture takes a lower priority and is not given what it is required to have. Il ressort de l'expérience, non, ici, non. il ressort de l'expérience congolaise que ce n'est pas par les armes, mais plutôt par le dialogue et la diplomatie que le CNDP de Laurent Kunda et les autres groupes armés ont mis fin à leur insurrection et que la paix est revenue entre Congolais. Uh, it is obvious from the, uh Uh, from the Congolese experience that it is not by arms but by dialogue and diplomacy that the CNDP of Laurent Nkunda and the other armed groups uh, bring an end to their uh, insurrection and rejoin the, the armed forces of the Republic, uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo and that peace uh, will be uh, brought to the entire Congo. Ce n'est pas non plus par les armes, mais plutôt par la négociation et la coopération que la paix a été rétablie et est en train d'être consolidée entre la RDC et ses voisins de l'Est que sont le Rwanda, le Burundi et l'Ouganda. Because it is not by arms, but rather by negotiation and cooperation that peace was reestablished and is in, in the process of being consolidated between the, uh, the RDC and uh, its uh, neighbors in the east, Rwanda, Burundi, and Uganda. Consacrer des ressources à une culture qui facilite le retour de la paix est un investissement parce que sans la paix, on ne peut rien construire. To consecrate uh, resources to uh, culture is uh, an important part of the peace process because without it, peace cannot be reestablished. Alors, j'ai parlé de dialogue et de diplomatie. Il s'agit de dialogue et de diplomatie politique, certes, mais aussi et surtout de dialogue des cultures et de la diplomatie culturelle. I've spoken about uh, dialogue and political diplomacy, yes, but cultural diplomacy and, and cultures uh, are, are important also. C'est en effet grâce à nos hommes et femmes de culture et à leurs œuvres, à nos musiciens, à nos artistes plasticiens, que mon pays a pu survenir, surmonter l'adversité survivre au projet de sa balkanisation et préserver son identité et son identité, son unité et son identité. In fact, it is because of our men and women of culture, especially our musicians and our, uh, uh, our artists and their work, that my country has been able to uh, surmount adversity Um, and to overcome the effort to balkanize it and to preserve its unity and its dignity. C'est en puisant dans la culture, dans la sagesse de notre culture ancestrale, faite de tolérance, d'acceptation de la différence, de respect et de compréhension mutuelle, que le président de la République démocratique du Congo 
Joseph Kabila Kabangé, principal artisan du retour de la paix dans le pays et dans la région, a créé les conditions d'une paix qui se confirme irréversible chaque jour davantage. It is by drawing on the wisdom of our ancestral culture, culture that it was made of tolerance uh, and uh, the, ac the acceptance of difference, respect and, and mutual comprehension, that mutual understanding that uh, the President of the Republic, uh, Democratic Republic, Republic of the Congo, Joseph Kabila Kabange, the, uh, the principal uh, artisan of the return of peace in, in the country and in the region, has created conditions for peace that confirm, uh, that are, are becoming irreversible more and more every day. C'est en parlant directement et sans tabou avec les rebelles, comme avec les chefs d'État de la région. Et c'est en encourageant, en recourant à l'histoire, telle que rapportée par la tradition orale, par nos griots, telle que enseignée dans les écoles, ou telle que véhiculée par nos musiciens et acteurs, qu'il a été possible de mieux nous connaître, de mieux nous comprendre, d'évacuer la suspicion et la méfiance et d'établir qu'au-delà des différences et des divergences, nous sommes souvent les mêmes, que nous avons un sort lié et que notre intérêt est donc de coopérer plutôt que de nous combattre. It is by speaking directly and without taboo with the rebels, come as, as uh, and as much as with the uh, heads of state of the region. And it is re returning to history, um, such as the, um, the use of uh, oral tradition to teach in the schools uh, that where our, mus our musicians uh, have, uh, have carried our tradition, as well as our actors and our painters, Uh, that it has, has made it possible for us to know each other, to understand each other better, to get rid of suspicion and mistrust, and to establish that by these differences and divergencies, we are more the same, that we have, that we are, have a, a common, dest a, a linked destiny, and that our interests are Uh, to cooperate uh, rather than to fight. Nous avons fait la mère expérience du prix exorbitant de la guerre. Nous savons que ça coûte cher en vies humaines, en argent et tout ça la guerre. We have the experience of uh, understanding the cost of war. We know what it costs in resources and human life. Nous sommes conscients de la position géostratégique au centre de l'Afrique de notre pays. We are aware of our uh, strategic position in the center of uh, Africa. C'est pour cela que nous sommes désireux de renforcer les conditions de sécurité mutuelle et de développement partagé en Afrique centrale. And it is for that reason that we are ready to, to participate, to share in the development, uh, the uh, political and, and economic development of the country. C'est pour cela que nous accordons beaucoup de prix à l'intégration régionale et à la cohabitation pacifique à travers les organisations sous-régionales. And it's because of this that we have put so much emphasis on regional integration and uh, peaceful co cohabitation uh, with uh, several, through so the, our participation in several organizations. Je citerai la communauté des pays des Grands Lacs I would, I, I would like to, to give, for example, the, um, the uh, CPGL, that is the uh, community of uh, countries of the Great Lakes. La communauté économique des États de l'Afrique centrale. The CEEAC, the economic uh, community of African, Central African states. Et la SADEC. Et la SADEC. La communauté la, de... which is the, the um, develop, uh, community, uh, development community of 
uh, southern African countries. Okay. Dans moins de 10 mois, soit le 30 juin 2010, la République démocratique du Congo fêtera ses 50 ans en tant qu'État indépendant et souverain. In less than 10 months, that is the 30th of June 2010, the Re Democratic Republic of the Congo will celebrate 50 years of uh, independence. Il en sera de même de la plupart des pays d'Afrique. And uh, the same thing is true of most countries in Africa. Comme tout anniversaire, ce sera un moment d'évaluation et l'occasion d'un nouveau départ. Like most anniversaries, it will be a moment of evaluation and opportunity for a new beginning. Je ne pense pas qu'il puisse y avoir meilleur moment, encore moins une façon plus efficace, de faire passer au peuple du continent le message de l'incontournabilité de la culture comme facteur et vecteur de paix et de la nécessité de faire de la culture une priorité politique qu'en tenant le prochain forum sur la, disparition, la diplomatie culturelle en terre africaine. Ah. I don't think that there could be a better moment and, uh, and even less a better way to uh, give the people of the continent the message of the, uh, the, the importance of uh, culture as a factor uh, in, and a, uh, a, a method to arrive at, at peace and the necessity of making culture a political priority. Uh, there cannot be a better way to do that than to hold the next forum of the cultural diplomacy on African territory. La République démocratique du Congo serait en tout cas très honorée de vous accueillir à cette occasion. The Democratic Republic of the Congo would be, in any case, very honored to welcome you on that occasion. En son nom, comme en celui de tous les autres pays des différentes organisations sous-régionales que je viens de mentionner. Um, he's speaking in his, uh, in his own name and also uh, in the name of all of those countries that are members of the organizations he just mentioned. Et dont nous avons la présidence d'ailleurs en ce moment. Hein, donc, euh. Of which they have the presidency at the moment. Et pour vous donner un avant-goût de l'accueil à la Congolaise que vous pourriez avoir si vous décidez de venir au Congo, tout à l'heure, à la fin de ce débat, je vais vous proposer de voir comment, il y a dix jours, nous avons souhaité la bienvenue à nos hôtes de la SADEC. En musique, bien sûr. Hier, c'était la musique du Sénégal. Aujourd'hui, si vous avez un peu de temps, ce sera quelques minutes de musique congolaise. And to give you a, uh, a taste of the uh, of Congolese welcome uh, that you will get if you accept uh, the proposal, uh, we, I will propose to you to listen to uh, music from the Congo at the end of this program. Merci. Thank you very much. Um, as I said before, we have. Um, let me. Uh, I have a couple of things that I want to say uh, first before you go on. I wanted to to, uh, to provide a little bit of a, of a framework before you move along. Um, as I said before, we, we haven't really talked very much about uh, the, the role of government, uh, but um, I, and because we haven't, perhaps, we haven't, uh, we haven't talked about the role of educational exchange in culture. And uh, about three quarters of, of, of US uh, dollars that are devoted to this general uh, activity 
go to educational exchange. So I think the next time that we, uh, the next time that we meet, or the next time that this, this is, is brought, uh, this subject is, is um, the idea of, of what government is doing in, in the cultural sphere, I think that, that needs to be discussed a little more, because much of what is being done in the educational sphere uh, bears examination. Uh, and I uh, would like very much to have that introduced uh, next time. Uh, obviously, educational exchange is one of the most important ways that uh, culture can be exchanged between peoples. But it's not scalable. It's very expensive. It's not scalable. And the, uh, uh, the, as we have seen, um, with each succeeding administration, there is a, a, a strong desire to see the money go further. Uh, so uh, as we move toward the next encounter, I hope that we can have some discussions around that subject. Um, very quickly, uh, because you are all actors and uh, activists in, in a field that touches uh, government activity, government action in educational and cultural exchange and in cultural diplomacy, uh, I thought you should have um, an update on where that is in government these days. Uh, so let me give you this very quickly. We still have uh, laughable levels of resources of applied to this field. Although it has to be said that the Bush administration doubled the money uh, going into educational uh, and cultural affairs, it's still less than one tenth of one percent of the military budget. So uh, at, at, at some point, if we are serious as a nation, we have to get serious about the resources. At some point also, I think we need a discussion about uh, what's happening with the Department of Defense money that is going into uh, educational and cultural exchange. Because uh, more and more, those resources are being uh, and, and used in that way. And, and I think Cynthia is going to have some things to say about that. We talked a bit about public and private partnerships. Well, public and private partnerships are, are nothing new. Uh, we have uh, public and private partnerships with the, uh, with the U.S. government uh, have been around for as long as I have, and that's uh, quite a while. Um, so uh, I think that the, 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 the scorecard is... Um, is now in the uh, in the D uh, D plus range uh, and needs to get better, and I think with this administration, um, perhaps it might. Um, but those of you who are uh, taxpayers in the United States, I hope you will get to your elected officials and say this matters, and that uh, when money bills for educational and cultural affairs uh, come up in State Department uh, uh, subcommittee hearings that your representatives will support. This administration has asked for $633 million for this, this uh, whole educational and cultural affairs budget. That's not very much money. That's less than well, that's not enough money, $633 million. Um, the House apparently wants to put in another $2 million. The Senate has uh, closed its bill at $630 million. But uh, if, as, as activists and as people who are directly concerned, uh, you should be on to your representatives. Um, I'll say one more thing before I turn this over to Cynthia. I know she's uh, eager to, uh, uh, to address you, but 
<laughs> One of the things that is uh, most troublesome to me is that, most troubling to me, is the loss of a professional core um, in public and cultural diplomacy. This is, with the demise of the U.S. Information Agency, the, uh, that function has been rolled into the Department of State. And there are many problems with that. But probably the most telling one, and the one that will touch you most directly, is the loss of a professional core of cultural officers who are your representatives in the field, who are the people who will work with you when you are bringing uh, dance companies or uh, exhibits or other uh, artistic operations and programs. Um, you have fewer people doing it, and they are less well prepared. Uh, and it isn't their fault. A, uh, now uh, a program officer or a, a cultural officer or even a PAO is somebody who has typically less than five years in government, whose first two years were spent stamping visas in the Philippines, and who has not had what his, his or her counterpart had in the old days with USIA, the mentorship of a body of other professionals with experience because back in Washington, there is no office that includes mostly uh, public diplomacy and cultural diplomacy professionals. Those offices are embedded in uh, the uh, regional bureaus, and in the regional bureaus, they have another focus. They have to deal with the noon briefing every day. They don't deal with your issues or cultural affairs. When I was, uh, the, the first job I had was in Baghdad uh, back in 1965, when, um, sorry, 1966, and I was, my first little job was to go down to Basra and help organize the concert of uh, Duke Ellington. Those days are long gone. Uh, but the, the point was you learned a lot because there were people there to help you and people there to show you what it meant. I saw from the beginning what happens with cultural exchange, the magic of uh, the emotional contact, connect that happens when uh, you sent your creative artists. Uh, and, and there is no substitute for that. As, as excited as I am about uh, Josh and Rita's second uh, life, and I am excited by it. There is no substitute for uh, what we did in the field. And those people who made it happen in the field, those Americans who made it happen in the field, are, uh, are no longer there for you. Uh, and the, uh, the Foreign Service nationals, who have in, in many cases remained, have no resources or have too few resources to be effective uh, actors on your behalf. So these are issues that you should know about. Uh, and uh, as activists in the field, you should make your voices known. With that little framework, let me pass the, the, uh, the word along to Cynthia. Thank you very much, uh, Kenton. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, monsieur. Well, realizing that I am standing in the way of uh, you all rushing to the phone and making the plans for traveling to the Congo, I am going to speak as quickly as I can, and not to mention that uh, drinks. So I'll um, speak, and maybe just lay a few, uh, present a few ideas in a more informal way, because I think it would be great to have a little bit of a discussion before we all leave. And so uh, provoking is probably the best way to do that. So I'll say two things to start the provocation. Um, I'm all for artists, but I actually hope that next time we have more policymakers. 
Uh, I think it's great to have the people who work with the military. It'd be great to have some military officers. Uh, we certainly need some more people from the State Department now. And, and there's talk of having maybe not maybe Congo the year peut-être l'année après au Congo because there's talk of, of having it possibly next year in Washington. And realistically, that's the easy way to do it. So the policymakers will say, "Ooh, a cultural diplomacy conference. Oh well." I'll just go and speak for an hour. I can do that. And then they will become hooked and go to the Congo the next year after that. But I think it's, it's very important to, to bring them in. I, I uh, lead the Arts and Culture Dialogue Initiative at the Brookings Institution, which, with the exception of Aspen, which I'm so excited to hear about, to most people in the policy world sounds like a complete and total oxymoron. But I do it very much, and it isn't, and my Brookings colleagues are wonderful, and I'm there even though I'm constantly reaching, you know, people are constantly saying, what, what do you do, culture, why are you here? Um, because of exactly the title of this session, culture as a political priority and a security priority, I spend my time trying to persuade my colleagues who really do make policy that people listen to that uh, culture, understanding other people's culture and how it operates in society and also understanding how our culture operates in those societies is absolutely critical to fighting extremism, empowering positive social change, and creating stable and economically successful societies. It's not an extra thing. It is right in there in the middle. And I am very encouraged to see as the uh, public diplomacy, strategic communications, whatever you want to hear it, poli uh, call it policy, emerges from this new administration. I'm very encouraged to see a shift away from the, here are our American values, please adopt them right now approach, to looking to see what is going on in societies trying to understand how changes are working in through local voices and then empowering those local voices. And the interesting kind of dirty little secret among um, the, the Foreign Service and our uh, diplomacy is that our greatest diplomats, the ones who are most respected from, if you will, the kind of hard power side of things, they know this. They understand this. Uh, probably the strongest supporter right now of this approach in the administration is Richard Holbrook. And other diplomats, uh, such as Tom Pickering and Nicholas Burns, both retired now, but kind of legendary uh, in their time, and still uh, Frank Wisner, who I have the pleasure of knowing but know about, all of these you know, real giants in diplomacy understood this. And I think it'd be great to get them together to talk about it because the people uh, in, the, in the service now will listen. Uh, um, and, you know, this can happen in the strangest ways. And that, that's why you have to take it seriously and observe what's happening. I would uh, suggest to you that um, one of the aspects of American culture that is having the most pervasive and most positive influence in the world today is American Idol. I'm waiting for the laughs and the groans. I want to hear the laughs and groans. People always laugh and groan. Uh, and the Smithsonian didn't even want to put the American Idol desk in its collection, which was a huge mistake in my view, because that program, not you know, specifically those people and specifically what they do, but that program with its core ideas of a merit-based competition with the winner selected by voting is such a radical idea in any tribal-based society. Now, the idea that you might win something because you actually are good at it, uh, not because your uncle knows the judge or you paid the judge a certain amount, uh, that is a, a huge change for many, many places. And uh, you know, as we know, it's not happening right away in the government. But it happens in this arena. And just take one country, Afghanistan, which has had the program Afghan Star uh, going now for four years, and you can see all about it in a wonderful documentary, which won the Audience Award in Sundance last year, called Afghan Star. 
one third of the country watched the finals in 2008. It's 11 million people, and that's just the ones they counted. Uh, and you know, we we don't understand this. We think, well, wait a minute, they don't have electricity. Why? 11 million people watching TV? No. You, uh, who knows how many TVs you have? Probably not very many. You see 50 people huddled around a TV set watching this. Uh, you see people going out with leaflets, campaigning for their person who they're in favor of. And it doesn't just divide along ethnic lines. Someone from a different, different ethnic group has won every single year. So there's a certain amount, of course, of ethnic allegiance. But someone different has won every year. So people vote for the person they think is best. Uh, people talk about it as a thing that's unifying the country, that's giving them a sense of their identity, because that's so much of what culture does. It gives you a sense of identity. And of course, in a country like that, that had to endure those years of the Taliban, it brings back and revives in a very powerful and accessible way their local traditions. So yes, they have uh, songs and radio stations where they play American pop songs. But in this program, they tend to sing Afghan songs. Uh, and then finally, it's an incredible platform for women. Uh, because women have been among the finalists every year. So you have women competing, competing publicly, winning. So far, a woman hasn't won the whole thing, but they've been right up there like third runner-up, uh, which is an incredibly empowering thing for uh, the population and certainly for young women. They also do this at great risk. Uh, they risk death threats. They uh, often can't go home, but you know, they, they, they persevere. And now the women who've risen high in this, they're cutting records, they're doing uh, music tours. So I, I, do, I use this example just to say you, you've got to be open to the impact of culture and not have a sense of where it belongs because you, know, you can hold all the seminars and sessions if you want on democratization, but this is what's doing it for people. Now, it doesn't solve all the problems, you know, it doesn't mean that Afghanistan doesn't have a corrupt government. But it's interesting how it works even there. Uh, right before the election, the um, largest independent media uh, outlet there, it's called uh, Moby Media, and the station's called Tolo TV, run by some Afghans who came back from Australia after the Taliban fell. Um, they started a program called The Candidate, and it was a contest about policy. And people went on stage and, and presented their policies for the country. And people voted. Now, in Afghanistan, you have to be 40 to run for president. And most of the people in the program were younger than that. They couldn't run for president. So it was it's really, I mean, imagine that. A contest program that lots of people are watching that is presentation of policies. People were glued to their TV sets. And what they said then provoked the actual candidates to address the issues that people cared about. Now, again, it did not mean that they, did, they had still had a totally corrupt election. But slowly, through these ways, you empower people and give them a sense that they have a voice and give them the experience of participating. So uh, the, the having independent media is so important. It's absolutely critical to any kind of change in society and to preventing extremism. And in Afghanistan, just as an example, this puts the US government in a very interesting position because we give, of course, a huge amount of support to the government. And the people who run this uh, TV station have said to me and other uh, policymakers, people actually in the government who could do something, um, what, what are you doing? You are funding this government. We are out there trying to promote new ideas, trying to promote change in society. And we are being censored, threatened. Our employees are being kidnapped by the ulema councils uh, they would say populated by uh, corrupt warlords who, uh, anyway, by, populated by corrupt warlords. And your government is empowering these councils who are in turn shutting down exactly what you allegedly would like to have done. Uh, so it, it, you know, it all becomes uh, circular and ends up coming back to hard uh, policy in the end. Uh, so I think this is totally connected to security. I, somebody interviewed me yesterday from a TV station here, a, a journalistic outlet here, and, and he said, yes, yes, but, but what do you say to the extremists? What, what do you say to those terrorists? How do you persuade them? Well, I, I kept trying to say that that really is not the point. You're right. I, I probably can't persuade them. And watching American Idol is not going to persuade them either. But 
what, where you work, of course, is in the environment. Uh, and you present, you make possibilities so that people don't make that choice out of desperation, which is usually the way that choice is made. Uh, and you, em you empower the people in the environment. And that means, again, not trying to make sure they all adopt American ideas, but also try to understand their own tradition and where are those ideas within their own traditions. And for example, just one other example I'll give, in many Arab-speaking spe countries, particularly in the Gulf and in, uh, in, in the Middle East and Northern Africa, Egypt and Jordan are two examples. The, avail the um, range of literature av available, reading material available, is extremely narrow. And I'm including university libraries in this. You always hear people always talk about, oh, the great Arabic civilization a thousand years ago. You don't have to go a thousand years ago. You can go a hundred years ago. There was an incredible renaissance in Cairo a hundred years ago with the people who traveled back and forth to Europe who were very open, who advocated a tolerant, multicultural society and wrote about it from Al-Azhar and the other leading institutes of education. You can't find those books anymore in Egyptian libraries. They're not there. Uh, and what you can't find is many, many extremist tracks. So you know, it's important to translate things. Yes, it's important to do that, but you know, it's important also to understand how societies could listen to their own voices and change. So for example, the library in Alexandria has a program to translate uh, those books again and republish them. I think that's the kind of effort uh, that we should be helping. Now I'm going to end on what uh, Ken asked me to talk about and I'm going to tie that into the Yusu Endor concert last night. Anyone who was there saw the just simply electric effect that he had on his audience. It was just amazing to watch those people uh, as Spaniards too, but a large number of Senegalese working here just reaching out for him as, as he sang. And you sense they just, you know, they, they almost felt that they could just touch him, they could, they could touch Senegal again. And the music, of course, was incredibly powerful, but of course he is also for what he stands for, what he told us about his incredible role as a social activist and as someone with such integrity uh, who people can trust totally. Well, the, um, so anybody, I say anybody who saw that, uh, this is not soft power. This is about as powerful as you can get. And um, the Defense Department understands that. And they are uh, embarking on a program of concerts in West Africa and uh, also connecting musicians with the diaspora in the United States are going to have a corollary one, a series of concerts in the United States. These are concerts with West African musicians. Their thinking is these are, these are very important areas. These are societies with a potential for instability. What is it that glues society together? It is music that glues society together. So we're going to find ways to use music effectively. Hats off to them for thinking that way. But of course, the next question is, why on earth is the Defense Department doing that? Uh, and so, you know, Secretary Gates wrote, gave that wonderful speech about diplomacy so important. To my knowledge, it has not yet been followed up with a check. Uh, and so this is the kind of crazy schizophrenic world that the government is living in in the moment. Uh, so, so good, good thinking, but disturbing um, execution. So I'll end on that. Thank you very much, Cynthia. Uh, we are needless to say, uh, running way over. But I do want to give uh, you an opportunity uh, to either ask, uh, ask any of us, uh, His Excellency the Minister or, uh, or the panel in general. Or maybe question. even other speakers. It, or, if there's yeah, another speaker I, you wanted to ask exactly you didn't get to, saying. go ahead and do that. Yes, Rita. Why don't people come to the, just save time, people who want to speak, come to microphones. Rita, then Sharon. Yeah. That was really great. Thank you all so much. It's really, it was really moving, and I thought you did a great job, so thank you. I just wanted to say in response to your comment, Kenton, that 
Our Second Life work is very much based in the physical world, and in fact, Cynthia was at the U.S. Islamic World Forum um, in Doha, Qatar, where the project kicked off, and there were two young hip-hop artists who had been invited to the forum, but not invited to perform. And so the Understanding Islam Through Virtual Worlds project, um, while virtual, was very much real. And in fact, we had Yaz, who is a young Iranian, who's the only Iranian who's permitted by the government to leave Iran to perform but was not performing at the forum, and Mohammed Mugrabi, who is a 21-year-old Palestinian. And so we were doing an event, very much a physical world event at the forum. Yes, it was piped into Second Life, but that's only because we had another global audience on the other. So I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Regina. Uh, I'd just like to give my last dancing contribution <laughs> and uh, remind people of uh, talking about government, of the marvelous walks of Gandhi, the beautiful walking with people that he did for peace. And who doesn't remember the beautiful dance of Mandela coming out of prison? I don't remember his words, and I wonder if people remember, but it said so much, that beautiful dance. And in the, this beautiful tradition of dance in Africa, I just received an email this morning saying that 21,000 people got together dancing in, uh, in honor of a new program that Oprah is um, promoting. And to end, I would like to inform that one of the beautiful things and beautiful uses of dance that has been going on right now between the, in the frontiers of Mexico and the U.S. are people dancing with each other across the borders. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Um, I, I really want to echo and support what you said about education exchanges. Um, and that doesn't, doesn't exclude culture because you, you bring in the arts, you can bring everything into that. One of the things that we have increasingly done is to focus so much of our work on the under 18s. I don't need to tell any of you here that there are some countries around the world um, where there has been, where there is a trust deficit, shall we say, where 60% of the population is, is under 18 and has no work, no opportunities, no anything. So much of our work is focused on educational links, contacts, and particularly providing um, something that we have, which is, I think, one of the great sort of commodities the, of the world, which is the English language. And English we no longer see, in a sense, as simply an access to culture. You learn French for an access to culture. You learn Spanish, German as an access to culture. English, there is the cultural side, but actually it's as important as learning IT skills. So a lot of what we're doing is, is around that because from what you were saying as well, Cynthia, you need to provide um, choices, alternatives to, to other more unpleasant extremist views. Um, a lot of our work is working um, and, and I know, um, Minister, that, that in, in your country too, many people are very young um, and anything that we're able to do, for example, in education in many parts of Africa, that's very much the focus of the under 18. So I, I agree, absolutely integral part of, of what we're doing. I couldn't, couldn't agree with you more. Thank you, Sharon. Yes. Okay, as a human rights person, I might be opening too big of a question here, but... Um, I've done a lot of research on the use of rape as a weapon of war, and I just have a question for the minister and how he foresees the country going forward and improving the moral culture, especially in regards to uh, women and children's rights, uh, especially the repatriation of child soldiers and women who have uh, experienced rape as a weapon of war and the children born of war who are labeled as unwanted, the rape, rape babies and so forth. Uh, have you the question? Non, parce qu'elle, elle, 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 quelles sont vos, euh, vos réflexions sur le problème des, des femmes qui ont été tuées mm -hmm. euh, euh, pendant la guerre comme euh, outil de, de, de violence, mm -hmm. de, de répatriation des, des femmes, mm -hmm. des femmes de, de, des autres de, 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 de choses liées à ça dans, dans son Well, um, first of all, I'd like to say that um, using um, uh, rape and um, 
sexual violence uh, to, uh, during war is, uh, is a, a war crime. It's a, a crime against humanity. Um, and it is stated as such in our constitution. Um, and uh, we intend to deal it very aggressively uh, by combating uh, impunity, uh, but also uh, <clears throat> by educating people. Uh, but first and foremost, by removing the basic conditions that uh, permit the, the commission of such acts, uh, which is bringing back peace to the country, doing away with all these armed groups, um, and um, as I said, being very tough with whoever is cocked uh, doing these type of things. Whatever is rank in the society, whatever is rank in the, in the army, uh, and um, we have started doing that, and we can see we can see a difference. Um, now, with regard to the uh, the, the, the child soldiers, is that it? Um, well, a again, it's a, it's about the same process. Uh, right now, uh, you don't have any uh, child soldiers in the official army. You find them in these armed groups uh, across the country. Uh, but we believe that by doing away with these groups, by dismantling them, which is almost totally done, um, we will again do away with that phenomenon, which is, which is not acceptable. Um, but in the meantime, we are managing these situations which come back from the, the, the period of, of war in the country. We are still having a lot to do uh, to clearly deal with the situation, but we are working in that direction. Yes, uh, Mine's very brief. I just wanted to, to corroborate what Cynthia was saying in this whole idea of bringing culture into um, other parts of the country that allow people to come together around culture. I know that um, in a recent conversation with Virginia Shore about the U.S. Art and Embassies program, she was advocating for um, regional art to come into the embassies, that we were up to this point exporting American culture through our embassies, whereas we should actually be embracing the indigenous and regional culture that where we're placing our embassies. Perhaps part of the reason why we have these great big fences and walls around our, our embassies. And I think it's important that as we look at diplomacy, that we are integrating and incorporating and extending open hands um, and addressing and recognizing the differences and diversities that uh, are, are present, you know, rather than um, exporting a uh, monocular view. So can you, I'm confused. Do you mean regional... Uh, regional American or regional in the region where you are? Region where you are, where you are. So that, I mean, in an embassy, I know, I, this conversation was about uh, seeking U.S. artists, American artists to be shown in American embassies. Well, where are the artists from that country in our U.S. embassies? I should be there because then you're going to get the, the um, uh, interests of that uh, there, uh, region. I, I, I would just say that uh, there are definitely reasons to feature local artists and ways to do it. The Art and Embassies program is actually, I mean, I would disagree with, uh, with respect, I would disagree with, uh, with, with the, uh, the premise that we should use local artists in the art and, and embassies. I think we should use American artists in the art, because it's a projection of American culture, and it is, it is put there to, to show American culture to uh, to the local people. Can I answer Why not that use too? both? Why not use both? No, no, Why you does should, it have to be one or the other? There is, a, there is a way to do both. And over the years, uh, as, as cultural attaché in, in both uh, Turkey and France and elsewhere, uh, one of the most important things you can do is uh, show respect for uh, and support local arts and, and connect lo American artists with local artists. In the, uh, in, in the mid-60s in Baghdad, we, uh, we brought an American artist in residence to Baghdad. We bought him uh, some paints and materials in the local market, introduced him to a couple of artists, bought, uh, uh, rented an apartment for him, and let him go for an, uh, for a, an academic year. And it was phenomenal. He knew every artist in town. The, the exhibit that was done at the end of the of that period was, uh, was still being talked about years later. So yes, I mean, the relationship between American art 
artists and, 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 and the artists of the region, uh, that's an, an, an indispensable thing to, to promote. Uh, I just think that the, the arts and embassies um, exhibit is, uh, program is something rather special. I mean, it has, it has a different purpose. Let me just give you a sense of actually how both of those work also. There is a wonderful exhibition of uh, contemporary Pakistani art now at the Asia Society mm -hmm. that I recommend to all of you. And I was talking with some of the artists, and they were talking about the wonderful interactions they have had in the past with American artists who've taken up on various exchange programs, residencies in, in Karachi, and you know, it seems hard to believe, but this did happen and, and had a huge amount of impact locally. But I would also defend American art for the Art and Embassies mm -hmm. program, which is the art that's shown in the ambassador's house. And um, so that is where you receive people. Uh, and it is that each ambassador has the opportunity to organize an exhibition in his or her resident that reflects of, of their choice. And the wonderful staff in the arts and embassies help yeah. you f locate the works. I, for example, chose to have works of art uh, by American artists that had something to do with Holland or Dutch art, uh, which included some phenomenal things, Alexander Calder Mobile, Willem de Koning, all sorts of great, great things. And the effect that had on Dutch visitors when they came in, because they would immediately, they didn't know all the artists, also had contemporary artists nobody would heard of. They didn't know the artists, but they right away saw, oh my god, that person likes Dutch art, and that person is you know, imitating Vermeer, or that person has been to this part of Holland. And it was a really nice kind of measure of respect, actually through American artists. So I'm, yeah. I'm for the American yes. artists. Um, Cynthia, I hope you will allow me to say something that I think you really meant. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Oh, you said we should have something in Washington because that's where the policymakers are. They're policymakers in every capital of every country in the world, as the talk of Monsieur Le Ministre demonstrated, and I think that has to be said. Thank you. Of, of course, there are. Canton began by talking about what was the position of our government. It is, you know, where Aspen is located, but it, of course, that goes without saying. Thank you. In what I believe is the spirit of con expressing a converging goal through a through. Uh, uh, different ideas, uh, I respectfully submit to this very distinguished panel, and picking up on your comments, uh, Madame, uh, about inviting uh, the views of my community, uh, the military community, those who have seen things on the ground, that I would beg to differ uh, with empowering. We this is just a voice to be heard, and I'm sure many of my military peers uh, who are now free and maybe retired to speak will say we're not empowering others. Uh, picking up, Ambassador Hinton, on your comments that one-tenth of one percent of the uh, military budget is, is, in, is in culture. Uh, that means that we have over-militarized the world. We discussed that at length uh, during the past uh, uh, past uh, meetings, and it means that, and we are over militarizing Africa, at least I can say that from my point of view as a political military analyst, and I believe that the word empowering, I take it for its full worth from you, is, should not apply in what we're trying to do in creating a common goal toward cultural understanding and resolving conflict as such through a divergence of ideas. But we are not here to empower other people. And I, as I said yesterday, I respectfully submit that offering anything, dancers, entertainment, a well, building a city, a theater, under any kind of military presence, which can only be seen as we would if it were in our country, in our town, in our neighborhoods, as a form of power over us is a pipe dream. You cannot offer culture with any kind of military presence, however benevolent, on your grounds. And in Afghanistan, where I've spent a lot of time in the past few years, I must say that the only thing that can be accepted by an Afghan, as it would by any of us, is our gifts, our ideas, 
our offerings through convergence of ideas through this kind of forum with no foreign troops on their ground. And the people who may be extremist would find their match among us if we were in their shoes with a military presence on their, uh, on our, on our land. So I think there's a, an oxymoron there. Thank you. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this has been a, a wonderful experience for me. I have, uh, again, uh, I, I want to express my thanks to uh, both Aspen and Niemeyer. Uh, my thanks to His Excellency Minister Chibanda for being with us and being so candid. Thank you very much. And my friend and colleague, Cynthia, uh, this has been uh, another uh, great. Uh, another great uh, experience. Thanks for being with us. And show. thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And are we going to show the film?